So good evening, everyone. I welcome you to the NGO webinar, The Whispers of Mary Anning and Other Pioneer Women Geologists. My name is Iva Kolenkovic Mochilac, and I am a geologist working at the University of Zagreb, Faculty of Mining, Geology and Petroleum Engineering, which is one of the partners of the NG Project Consortium. I will be the host of the webinar today, uh, really as a substitute for our project coordinator, Professor Eva Hartai, who unfortunately couldn't join us. Uh, we are very happy to host this webinar in which two inspiring initiatives paying tribute to pioneer women geologists will be presented. And these initiatives are the Mary Anning Rocks campaign and the book Geas, Women Who Study the Earth. So we invite you to pose questions to the speakers using the question and answer function in Zoom. And we will select and answer some of these questions at the end of the webinar after the presentations. So uh, just before I give the floor uh, to the invited speakers, I would like to briefly present the project, NG project. The NG project uh, is really a EU, uh, EU founded project that uh, aims to turn the interest of 13 to 18 year old girls to study geosciences and related engineering disciplines. And career choices are actually usually made uh, in this age and the impact of the project is expected to contribute uh, to improve the gender balance in these set of disciplines. Uh, within the consortium, we are 25 partners covering altogether 21 countries in Europe. So since the beginning of the project, we have organized several outreach events and activities like photo and video contests, a geoscience methodology course for science teachers, uh, different webinars and field trips and many other activities. And all these activities were preceded by analysis of the state of geoscience education in Europe. And all our activities are based on the best practices in teaching STEM. So in 2020, about 8,000 persons were directly involved in the NG actions. And in 2021, that number raised to 17,000. And we have about 400,000 tweet impressions until now that much about Angie. And now I will present, uh, I'm very glad to present the first speaker, uh, Anna Ruiz Constant. And she's one of the authors of this really inspiring book, Geas, Women Who Study the Earth. And the book is available in Spanish and English. And currently the NG project is collaborating with the authors to produce versions in more European languages. Uh, I also tr translated with my uh, colleague uh, uh, the book uh, on creation, and I was very happy uh, to have that privilege. So, hello, Anna. The floor is yours. Hello, Eva. Thank you, uh, Eva, for the presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank NG and EFG for their involvement in the HEAS Women who study the Earth project, uh, which has been fundamental uh, so that today we can enjoy the English version. A special thanks also to Anita, Maria, Isabel for their support, uh, and all the colleagues that are doing the translations uh, to other language. Um, well, as uh, as all of you perfectly know, uh, geology is the science that explores the earth, that digs up its insights to uncover the shakes and shifts that our planet has experienced through time. Since our origins, humans uh, have felt attracted to the mysteries hidden by this squash sphere, this blue dot in space. And although curiosity and talent transcend gender barriers, history has omitted uh, without hesitation the contribution of remarkable women who not only faced the unknown, but also stood up uh, to the stereotypes and social conventions of their time. This situation is clearly described by this quote from Rosa Montero, a Spanish writer, who invites us to listen to the whispers of women. And this is what we have tried to do with hairs. 
with this premise, uh, the authors of this book go down to work. Uh, Rosa Maria Mateos and I, uh, both geologists, took care of the writing. And um, Nibola Lauia, um, uh, an environmentalist and um, illustrator, was in charge of giving them life through her brushes. Uh, the idea for this book arose from uh, the discussions held within the framework of the Women and Geology Commission of the Geological Society of Spain, to which uh, both Rosa and I belong. We discuss uh, about what is an irref irrefutable reality that we have learned to become geologists uh, without the influence of any female reference without uh, knowing their names. Certainly the veteran women scientists that uh, encounter hairs will see themselves described in these pages in many places. Uh, all of them known uh, and anonym anonymous have made and continue to make possible the unstoppable advance of women rights in science. Uh, to the young readers uh, who someday will transmit this knowledge to others, we offer the, the wise advice of the Australian geology, geologist uh, Dorothy Hill. Do not wait for the world to offer you what you might think to be your due. And the, the time has come to, to bring these relevant women to the light, to dust off the history books, to write the missing lines detailing their success, deeds and discoveries with the support of uh, the Association of Ever-American Service for Geology and Mining, the European Federation of Geologists, the European Project NG, and also in this English version uh, with uh, Geolatinas. But uh, before starting to talk about this pioneers, the, the authors want to make special attention uh, mention of the fellow geologists who have made the project their own and have dedicated time and effort to make it go ahead and reach the greatest number of people. The Women and Geology Commission uh, leaders that constitute the Spanish version team and the Geolatinas leaders who translated the text and constitute the English version team. In addition, many other colleagues are now working to translate the book into many languages, uh, uh, and I, I really thank all of them. We trust that through this sisterhood, uh, the, life, uh, the lives of these 12 pioneers of geology will become now uh, around the world. And uh, this slide want to represent uh, this, uh, this feeling. Well, at this point, uh, I would like to make a clarification because for our non-Spanish speaking readers, the word heas may seem mysterious or meaningless. Hea in Spanish or Gaia was the name of the primeval goddess who personifies the earth in um, Greek mythology. We use it as a symbol for all the women who have dedicated themselves to, to studying the earth. Uh, with Heas, uh, we will travel, travel through time to give voice to 12 women geologists of different times, historical context, uh, and also nationalities, but all with something in, uh, in common. They made an indelible mark on the strata of our knowledge. These 12 women challenged the society of their time uh, to advance along the difficult and demanding path of science. You will see in the next slide that Nibola Uya has managed to capture in her illustration the souls and diversity of these ladies of the hammer and the compass. The pioneers are presented to our eyes in the middle of their work, authentic, full of nuance and surrounded by a multitude of detail, these guys in earthly, oceanic and stellar brush strokes. It, uh, it has been really difficult to select only 12 women 
who will give us a global per perspective of, uh, of, uh, of earth sciences. And at the same time, show us universal problems of the incorporation of women as professionals in geology without revealing too much so that you can enjoy reading the book, uh, I will give a glimpse of each of these women. We uh, begin this journey with Mary Anning, without a doubt the best known of all these women and the link with the Mary Anning Rocks in initiative. She was uh, able to overcome all barriers of being a single, low-class woman with no education and make a place for herself in history. Mary was aware that the gentlemen of science used her to gain prestige without crediting her, and the situation remained thus until al almost the end of her days. Her findings evidenced that the earth was inhabited previously by vastly different species, questioning uh, creationist theories and forming the foundations of the theory of evolution that Darwin will formulate 50 years later. Although she worked at a distance from normal institutions, uh, her discoveries were so incredible that she has been called the mother of paleontology. We now focus on uh, um, Florence Bascom. She obtained a PhD in geology, uh, receiving tuition behind a screen so that she would not distract her male classmate. However, other values remain for her to break down. Florence's dissertation was so brilliantly presented that uh, she was chosen as a member of the Geological Society of America only uh, the second woman to achieve this status. Her remarkable advances in the fields of crystallography or um, mineralogy draw the attention of the United States uh, Geological Survey, who uh, for the first time in their history signed up uh, a woman. But uh, Florence's most important defining feature was her godmothering, her determination to train future women geologists and expand the American field by planting the first seeds of what would be a, a brilliant generation of, of women. We continue with uh, Inge Lehmann. Uh, she was uh, educated in the egalitarian environment of a mixed uh, and progressive school. This environment anomalous for, for the time pushed push her to develop to her full potential. She is specialized in seismology in Denmark, a country that was practically a, a seismic. But as uh, she will later learn, um, ideally located for recording earthquakes in geology, uh, geologically active and distant areas of the earth. She worked practically alone, which gave her an uh, unrivaled knowledge of the patterns of seismic waves passing through the earth. She began to suspect that something else was lurking in the earth's uh, liquid core. And uh, a major earthquake in New Zealand gave her the key uh, to the problem. She described uh, a new seismic discontinuity in the earth structures, a new boundary separating the well-known liquid outer core from an unknown solid inner core. It's uh, the turn of Margaret Thomas Williams. Uh, she enrolled in the normal school for color girls to train to be an educator. However, her interests were uh, beyond her classroom windows. Her mind flew across river, mountains, and uh, lakes because uh, Jean Marguerite's true passion was nature. She worked full time as an elementary school teacher while beginning a, a program to receive a, a Bachelor of Science degree in, in geology. She became 
the first African-American person to receive a, a doctorate in, in geology. In her dissertation, Margaret concluded that, um, that human activities such as deforestation or urbanization contributed significantly to the river's virulence and were reflected in the tragic floods. She was not only a visionary regarding the importance of human activity as a geomorph geomorphic agent, but also um, uh, awaken a new way of understanding geological processes. I would like now to focus on uh, uh, Dorothy Hill. Um, she grew up uh, in a modest family with no connection to science, but according to family memories, Dorothy had a keen mind and her school life can be summed up in a succession of scholarships and achievements that allow her to enter the faculty of science. But if there is one symbolic image or Dorothy Hill is that um, of a horse, uh, horsewoman. Um, it was in disguise that she undertook uh, her earliest research riding through the fossil seas of Western Australia in search of carboniferous coral outcrops. She left a, a huge, legacy, huge legacy of scientific papers, as well as a trail of firsts. She was the first female professor at an Australian university and the first female president of the Australian Academy of Science. And now, I, I will uh, talk about Mary Leakey. Uh, Mary was born into a nomadic and cos cosmopolitan family. In this context, Mary, uh, who in her old age had accumulated nine honoris causa doctorates, barely had an academic training. But curiously, Mary's uh, gifts for drawing opened doors for her as illustrator in different fossiliferous areas in Africa. The, there there, she also met her husband, Louis Leakey, forming uh, a couple that wrote the most brilliant pages of science uh, on human, human evolution. Mary was born on, on old age when the greatest discovery of her career arrived, the first human footsteps, the trail of the curious monkey uh, that got down from the trees to walk upright on the earth. Uh, the Australopithecus uh, afarensis, our remote ancestor, made Mary Leakey uh, a universal legend. We continue with um, Mareta West. She worked for more than a decade in the flourishing oil and gas industry. In the 60s, in the middle of the Cold uh, War, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy delivered the speech that would kick off the American race to the moon, whose surface and geology were still great unknowns. The, the challenge posed by the USA to the Soviet Union would make Marietta West the first female astrogeologist. She was uh, the only woman on NASA's experimental geology team that prepared the first manned lunar landing, the Apollo 11 mission. She participated in the development of maps uh, that were used uh, for astronaut training and, uh, and was responsible for mapping and marking the most suitable landing point for the fragile Eagle lander, in which Armstrong and Aldrin were to travel in July 1969. It's uh, the turn um, of Maritha. She was, um, she was aware of what the future held for her as a, as a woman, teacher, secretary, or nurse. She chose uh, the first option. However, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the shortage of men opened doors for women in new professional fields, and Marie worked for some years in the industry. 
After a while, she left and started to map the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean together with uh, the, the geologist Bruce Heeson. Bruce um, acquired the data while on board the, while on board the ship, and um, Marie uh, interpreted them on land, as women were forbidden to board. To, to the map of the North Atlantic uh, were added maps of the South Atlantic, Indian, and Antarctic oceans, and finally, of the whole uh, oceanic floor. The oceans will never again be uh, a uniform, monotonous uh, blue spot. Her maps completely changed geological thinking and gave rise to the theory of plate tectonics. Now uh, we focus on Carmina Virgili. She uh, received a university education when it, it was not yet common. Uh, and she became the third female science, uh, science professor in Spain. She specialized in the stratigraphy of the Triassic and Permian, a time of upheaval and great change. Much like the political times she lived uh, through. In the last years of the dictatorship, Carmina was part of the clandest uh, clandestine socialist organization and became involved in the changes that were taking place at, at the university. In the 80s, she was uh, Secretary of State and drafted the, the university reform law, which uh, which was the catalyst for the obsolete Francois University to become a more democratic one, uh, committed uh, to research and uh, open to society. Maria Fernanda Campa, uh, she was born in, in Mexico in the, in the bosom of a militant and combative uh, left-wing family. She, she joined uh, the, Mexi the Mexican Com Communist Party, uh, initiating an active militancy as a, a student leader. La Chata uh, studied geological engineering, being the first woman in the country with uh, this achievement under her belt. As a geologist, uh, she also revolutionized the public's view of geology. She participated in the founding of the Mexican Petroleum Institute and uh, in the creation of a working group whose uh, objective was to defend the inalienable right of the general public to benefit from subsoil riches. We continue with, with Katia Conrad. Throughout her teenage years, she devoted she devout, uh, anything volcano related that crosses her path. Curious and methodical, her first scientific job uh, acknowledged her, her early promise in the field of, uh, of volcanology. During those years, she met her husband and, and future partner, uh, Maurice uh, Kraft, a geologist who, just like her, had grown up dreaming on volcanoes. Katia and Maurice uh, devoted uh, their lives to traveling uh, anywhere in the world that uh, showed the slightest sign of an imminent eruption. Cameras at hand, they were pioneers in filming, photographing, and recording volcanoes. In the last few years, they work on designing information campaigns about volcanic risks and developing alarm de devices. They, they died uh, doing their work in Japan, where they filmed uh, what they would rank to be the most uh, dangerous eruption they have ever seen in their, in their lives. Well, we, we ended up uh, talking about Catherine uh, Dwyer Sullivan. Uh, she has led a life filled with ups and downs. During her studies, she actively participated in a series of um, oceanographic expeditions to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the Pacific Ocean. 
Uh, later on, she initiated a Copernican revolution in her career, swapping uh, turbulent marine uh, waters for the silence of space. She became a NASA astronaut, and she was the first woman to undertake extravehicular activity. Catherine uh, finally left NASA to hold related position in different scientific institutes and to dedicate to a scientific uh, dissemination. But she, uh, she was still to perform one more feat. She became the first woman to reach the Challenger Deep, the deepest point on, on Earth. I hope uh, that, that this uh, brief uh, walk through the lives of these geology pioneers has left a, a good impression uh, and the desire to continue getting to know them better through Hea's women who study the earth. If so, I invite you to visit the NG uh, project uh, webpage where the English and also the Spanish versions of uh, Hea's has been released open access this, this afternoon. And um, this all, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Anna. That was a really, really interesting presentation. And it was such an inspirational book to read. And it, it is beautifully written and beautifully illustrated. And for those who still haven't read Gas. Uh, to, just to get the idea how beautiful this book is written, I will read the text uh, by which Anna introduced herself in Geas. So, Anna radiographs the interior of the Earth and analyzes its external scars to get a little closer to its history and most intimate secrets. She is in search of any initiative that helps to show geology for what it is an exciting science that is useful for society. I was really impressed, I must say, and I don't think I've ever heard a geologist, you know, describing their profession in such a poetic way. Uh, I really admired it. It looks like passion. <laughs> yeah, it, it is really passionate and really, and this is just how the book is written. So it's passionate and it's just beautifully written. Thank you again. Thank you for your words. Thanks. So uh, just to have, I see that we have in a question and answer that our um, speakers will answer some of your questions after the presentations. But uh, I can see there is the uh, question about uh, will the presentations be available somewhere afterwards? Uh, there will be uh, the video of this, the, so the webinar is recorded and the recording will be put on the NG YouTube channel. So there you can, afterwards, you, you could uh, really access it through the NG uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so, and now, uh, if you have any uh, questions uh, for Anna about the book, uh, you can submit them through the question and answer function. And uh, as I said, we will try to, to reply uh, to uh, some of the questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, so one of the uh, women that was featured in the book Geas is Mary Anning, and she takes us uh, to our next presentation and our next speaker, Anya Pearson, uh, who is co-founder of the inspiring Mary Anning Rocks campaign. Hi, Anya. So Anya uh, is a graduate from Northumbria University with a BH uh, honors degree in fashion design and marketing. And she has worked in the fashion industry for over 30 years. And uh, she's also known for uh, her activity as a co-founder, trustee, and spokesperson for the charity Mary Anning Rocks. And to, that's also why she's with us today. So uh, Anna, uh, uh, Anya, sorry, oh, we give you uh, the floor and uh, hope for your interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for introducing me. And Anna, thank you for a, an absolutely brilliant um, uh, a show of your book, because I was actually quite shocked that there were a couple of amazing women in there that I've never heard of. So it just shows you how, you know, you think 
oh, I know it all, you know, and all these amazing women. And there was like two or three, I was like, I've never heard of her before. So it just shows you, yeah, you, you're always constantly learning. Um, I'm going to share my um, screen with you. Um, so I normally when I do um, get asked to do talks about um, Mary Anning and the charity Mary Anning Rocks, and normally I have to do a whole big chunk about who Mary was and why she was so amazing. But I feel like when I when I speak to um, people who are like minded uh, who are in the geosciences, it's quite a nice it's quite nice not to have to go into that much detail. But I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of her for those of you that possibly might not be au fait with, with Mary and her story. Um, so just in a nutshell, she um, lived, she was born and lived about 30 minutes from my front door. And I only learned about her 17 years ago. And the only reason why I learned about her was from the amazing Tracy Chevalier book uh called remarkable creatures that i read in our local book club and i thought wow because i kept having to remind myself that this was based on fact and what Tra tracy chevalier does is that she immerses herself into um facts and then creates a, a narrative around these historical uh and amazing stories that she pulls together she was the author that did the girl with the pearl earring um and I just couldn't believe that in all these years that I had never once heard Mary's name ever mentioned. And in the 70s, we used to drive all the way from Manchester and have uh, holidays in Lyme Regis and Charmouth where she used to fossil hunt. And her name was never once ever mentioned, ever. Um, and I found that really, really shocking. Anyway, she was a working class uh, person. She was born into poverty. She had no formal education. She educated herself. She was born in, 19, in 1877. Um, so at the height of her fame, probably the, the beginning of the Victorian era. Um, and she just worked really hard, educated herself, taught herself to read and write, never gave up, was completely, must have been such an, in, an incredibly intelligent mind for her to have done the things that she did. Uh, at a time as well when women were allowed to even own property or vote, let alone, you know, be involved in these things of science that only men could be involved with. Um, but by the age of sort of 22, 23, she was famous. You know, she was famous in her, in her own right. She had people coming from all over the world to, to come and see her and ask her opinion on things. And um, even royalty, you know, came to her and asked her opinions on things and many famous collectors and museums. And so it, it's just incredible to kind of think of all these things that she achieved in her lifetime to then just be completely and utterly forgotten. Um, and I'm just quite quickly flicking through because one of the things I do love about Mary's story is the amount, because obviously I come from an arts background rather than a scientific background. So I always gravitate towards artist, artist illustration and, and graphics and, uh, and artworks. Um, and I just love the fact that there are all these um, absolutely amazing illustrations um, about her. And I, I just like to share them. So, yeah, incredibly um, astute young woman. She paved the way. I mean, they, lots of people call her the mother of modern day paleontology. If it wasn't for Mary doing what she did at the time that she was doing it, you know, people like Charles Darwin's theory of, of evolution would never have kind of he, he kind of um, was on her shoulders. He used a lot of her work in a lot of his um, own studies, um, and then died in complete poverty um, in her early 40s from breast cancer. So breast cancer, so a very short, um, very sad life, um, and then fell into obscurity. And it, it just kind of, it, her life and what she did and who she was just kind of sums up a lot um, about how women are viewed in science, even to this day, really. Um, and I think her tale of uh, being able to take herself out of poverty and self-educate herself is such an inspirational story that should be told over and over again to lots and lots of people. And, you know, it's only recently in the UK that she's even been added to the um, curriculum by name. She's actually mentioned by name. Um, and that only happened about five years ago. And that is a uh, four and five year old. So it's like a preschool. It's quite early education which is great um so yeah I 
I started this campaign off the back of a very, very innocent uh, question that was asked to me. And um, we were like, so why a statue? Why is a statue so important? You know, and we get asked that quite a lot, actually. And I think I always assumed it was because we live in a world of modern technology and, you know, statues are always kind of seen as quite old fashioned, like old fashioned ways of, of championing and, and kind of respecting people. Um, but it was this it was this question. So we, my daughter and I like to fossil hunt. And about four years ago, we were coming off the beach at Lyme Regis. And um, she stopped and asked me if she could go and see Mary's um, statue. And she said this question to me when I told her that Mary didn't have a statue because uh, she was working class and she was a woman. She was three things you didn't want to be in Victorian Britain, female, poor, and um, working class. So she had stood no chance of ever um, being remembered after her death. Um, and my daughter was 10 years old and she looked me in the eye and she said these words, why is it not okay for women to be amazing after all this time, mommy? And I just thought, you know what, you're right. She had uh, had this sparkling, this is my daughter, this is how it all started. She had this real kind of um, sparkle in her eye and actually a physical rash on her neck where she was so angry she was so angry that this amazing woman had never ever been recognized or remembered in her hometown um and they've been all they've been learning at school actually this is what kind of triggered it for her they've been learning about um, this is a statue of Melissa Fawcett who was one of only a handful of working class members of the um, suffragette movement um and about um six years ago there was a huge campaign um, to raise a statue of Millicent or any uh, a female political figure in Parliament Square because there was not one single female in Parliament Square in the UK, in London, um, which is just shocking in its own, you know, when you think about that, it's just shocking in its own, in its own right. So they'd been learning about 100 years of suffrage at school. They'd learned about this statue that Millicent had in London. So Evie put two and two together and, and assumed that Mary had her statue. No, she didn't. So um, that's when we decided that we were going to do something about it. And so that's when Mary Annie Rocks was created and we decided that we were going to raise money and we were going to build Mary her statue. So I just wanted to spend more of this talk with you, talking to you about why statues are important um, and what they mean in our society. So I'm just going to take you through some facts and figures that I think you'll find quite interesting. Plus, this is very UK centric stuff, I'm going to tell you, but I think the UK is a little microcosm of what is happening globally. I think what's happening here and has, ha has happened in the UK here is exactly a blueprint of what's been going on right across the globe. So wherever you live, you'll recognise what we're about to show you, because this is a global thing. You know, this just isn't just a UK centric thing. So basically, I'm going to take you through and uh, show you something, you know, and you're thinking, oh, what are all these statues of men? Well, in the UK, this is just UK statistics, 85% of all statues in the UK are of men and only 3% are of women. The balance of the 12% are abstract forms. So they are forms that are um, a, a, a humanoid form, but indistinctive. So you can't tell whether they're male, female or, what, or animal, beast or mineral. So 85% of all statues in the UK are of men. I just found those statistics absolutely appalling. And, you know, and for me, it's kind of what we're we telling our children when they see constantly just men casting bronze and put on pedestals. What does that actually tell our boys and girls when they're growing up? Who, as a society, are we uh, respecting and, sh and championing and, and kind of calling out as, as great people when 85% are men. If you are Queen Victoria in Britain, I don't know whether this will apply across the rest of Europe, but if you're Queen Victoria, you're, you're doing well because the, out of that 3%, the majority of those 3% of those statues are Queen Victoria. I think in her reign, there must have been probably about 200 statues that went up across the UK of Victoria. Or if you're an allegory, so this represents um, education, this represents sorrow, uh, sorrow and sadness. So if you're an allegory, you're doing okay, because there's lots of those. So the female form is always used to represent 
those kinds of things. And obviously this is a famous one that's on top of um, uh, St. Paul's, not St. Paul's Cathedral, where the, um, this is justice, the balance and scales of justice. But the minority of statues of women in the UK were naked. Oh, Kelsey So, you know, no, no surprise there that were either portrayed as king, as queens or as allegories or were naked. And that to me is just not good enough. There is a very, very uh, lovely saying that I have heard for a long, long time, and I never fully knew where it came from and who used to say it, but it was this wonderful woman who was called Marianne Wright Elderman. And she was a famous children's rights activist. And she was the one that coined the phrase, you cannot be what you cannot see. And I think that that is so true. If we do not have these heroes to look up to and these amazing women for our children to look up to, then how can we ever expect them to see themselves in their form? So I just thought I'd share that quote with you and where that came from, because I just thought that that just says it all in a nutshell, really. Um, and believe it or not, and this is hard to believe, there are actually more statues in the UK of goats than there are of named women. And by named women, I mean women that have done great deeds. So it's not a queen and it's not a fictional made up uh, statue of a female form like the mermaid or something like that. There are more statues of goats than there are of named women. So again, just, just really shocking. And, you know, I can laugh about it now because when I come to the end of this chat, I'm going to give you some really good news about statistics and what's happening. But this was four years ago when we were pulling this report together and it was just gobsmacking. It really was. So I've got a little bit of a quiz for you. Uh, and again, this is another really mad, mad um, statistic. So I'm going to show you some statues and have a little think when you look at them. Some you might not get, some you'll recognise straight away. But what do all these statues have in common? There are more statues in the UK of men called John than there are, are of all named women. So again, these just statistics just keep piling up and piling on that just beggars belief, really. Um, and I'd love to really apply these uh, statistics against other countries just to see what, what happens there and what kind of statues, you know, like maybe, I don't know, maybe in Spain there's more statues of bulls than there are of named women, I don't know. I think it, it'd be quite interesting to have a little kind of dig around. Okay, so why is all this important? This is all important because these are things that we visually see in our landscapes all the time. You know, these are things that sit in our communities and, and almost sub, they're, they're kind of a subliminal way because we don't, I think... We don't wander around going, oh, statues, 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 but they are there. They are a part of our kind of psyche and who we are, who we are as a as a as a as a as a as humanity and as communities. Um, so I think it's hugely important that they should be fully representational of the communities that they stand in, and they just don't do that. And I just wanted to also show you another uh, example of the kind of symbolic uh, annihilation of, of women in this country. These are bank, British banknotes. Um, British banknotes have had, it was a trend that started in the 70s where famous people would be put on the back of banknotes. Um, and as you can see, there's again, a very, very similar theme. You know, all of these since uh, 1970, since William Shakespeare actually was the first one, have been mainly men. There have only been uh two named women we don't again count the queen bless her she's on every single one obviously but we have to discount because we're talking about women that have earned their place have, have done great deeds have done amazing things especially for uh, people to look up to and to be inspired by um and one is the um elizabeth fry who was a a reformer she changed a lot of laws for women imprisonment and their children. So an, an incredibly um, insightful woman when you consider the timescales that she was doing her work. 
The other one, obviously, is Florence Nightingale. She's still on our £10 notes, and Florence Nightingale needs no introductions. Um, and then the third one was only ever agreed by the Bank of England, which is Jane Austen, after a huge outcry when um, they wanted to take, um, I think it was, it was, yeah, it was uh, Elizabeth Fry. They wanted to take Elizabeth Fry off and replace her with another man, which would have mean we would only have one female on our banknotes. So again, just another um, absolutely unbelievable example uh, of women being um, whitewashed out of our society. And again, it has a name, symbolic annihilation of women. And that's exactly what all of this boils down to. So again, why is after all this time, is it not amazing for women to be amazing women? This is a sketch that Evie did of the statue at the time. Um, and I think one of the key things, and we, we, we've talked about this and Anna talked about this as well, but again, from a UK centric point of view, statistically speaking within the UK, girls outperform boys in STEM subjects at school. So that's GCSE level and A level within the UK educational system. That is a statistic fact. And it never changes. Girls outperform boys in STEM subjects, full stop. However, and this is the, the thing, and this is where it gets really worrying, that although school age girls excel at STEM, when it comes to selecting and attending university and going on into careers in the sciences, there is a huge decline. Girls are just not taking up STEM, STEM subjects. And those subjects specifically are in um, engineering, technology and computer science. So across the board, STEM is a big problem with women entering. Uh, we just don't have enough of them. But specifically within engineering, technology um, and computer sciences, it's a huge, huge problem. And I think the one that worries me the most is computer sciences, where we so definitely need um, our insight um, and our intelligence um, and definitely we need our, our voices with it within there. Um, so to me, that's quite um, an important thing that we need to address. Um, so you can see why campaigns like this are so important so that we can visualize and give our young women and men a balanced role model to look up to and to be inspired by. And then I just want to finally sort of wrap up to talk to you about all these amazing um, groups of people that are, so uh, the, uh, part of our journey, a four year journey to raise the statue, um, we reached out to other organizations that were doing kind of similar things. Um, and off the back of that, because it was so helpful to us, whenever anybody reached out to us during the four years that we've been doing what we've been doing, We've always been really open and really helpful. Um, and it's just grown and grown and grown. Um, and now it's turned into another spin-off group. And we are a group called Visible Women. And we have now 15 campaigns across the UK. Uh, and we're a women supporting women group. And we help one another. Um, and this is just a handful of some of the campaigns that we're working on at the moment. So in the top um, left, we've got the Match Girls. So these were a group of teenagers I mean these were really young girls during the Victorian era uh, who were making matches in the east end of London for the big match factory there which was really chemically I mean some of the horrific chemical exposures that they would have and the diseases that they would get they got this horrendous jaw um, they got the sulfur would cause these um, bone deficiencies and they had these awful awful horrible uh, bone degenerative disorders uh, but these teenagers um, dare to strike and go against the factory owner and they managed to get equal pay for the work that they did at the same as the men and this was back in the Victorian era you know but who knows about them they've been completely forgotten you know and they should be completely uh, remembered and, and, and you know even more so than some of the other more well-known ones the, the, the one in the middle on the bench this is um, a statue of Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf, obviously a very well-known name, um, but incredibly, there's only a bust of her. There's not a full statue of her. And this beautiful, beautiful um, statue of her on a bench is going to be unveiled on the River Thames in Richmond, where she lived. Um, this beautiful statue on the right of a woman holding a bird. This is the woman who started the RSPB, so the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds in the UK. I had no clue 
I had no clue till about six months ago that this amazing organization was started by a woman who wanted to stop the horrific killing of birds for fancy hats in the Victorian era, you know? And again, this forgotten history, it's just crackers. Um, and then we've got um, Mary Clark, another um, uh, suffragette. She was the first person, um, she was the first martyr actually. She was the first to die um, from being force fed. So when they went on hunger strikes uh, and they were arrested and sent to jail, uh, Mary Clark was the first to die from the wounds inflicted on her from being force fed. The picture in the middle is one of probably two statues to black women in the UK. And this is the remarkable Henrietta Lacks. If you don't know about Henrietta Lacks, have a read. Her stem cells that were taken from her without her permission in the 1940s because she had a um, operation, she had, her, she had ovarian cancer, no, womb cancer and had a womb removed. Her stem cells are absolutely, um, not, science aren't really sure why, but they don't die. And um, her stem cells to this day still exist. And scientists have been able to use her cells to be able to cure all sorts of, her stem cells were even used in some of the cures for um, the vaccines for COVID, but she helped, her cells helped um, polio, um, vaccines, all sorts of different things. So incredible, incredible woman, a very unsung woman because these things were taken from her without even her knowledge. Um, and then the statue on the right is of Afra Ben, who was probably the first British woman to earn her living from writing. So she used to write plays, uh, quite naughty plays as well, actually, quite sort of tongue in cheek, quite risque for the time, poetry. But she was also a spy for um, King Charles's um, uh, court as well. So a very, very interesting woman. And again, all these women, what they have in common, have all been forgotten. So, yeah, so we have a group called um, Visible Women that now are championing all of these incredible forgotten women of history to make sure that we are putting statues up in all corners of the globe. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> to make sure we've got these amazing role models for our children to look up to and to be inspired by. Um, thank you for listening and I hope you found that interesting. Hopefully got lots of questions, um, but that's me. Thank you. And um, I look forward to answering your questions. <coughs> that was really, really interesting <coughs> i think it was ice opening for many yeah uh i uh, just i really liked your presentation and uh i just wanted to add that with team nanji we also started uh, from that fact that you mentioned that you cannot be what you can see and it's totally true because we came to a conclusion that role models are really, really important. And it's really problematic not to have sheroes represented yeah. in public. Yeah. Definitely. So uh, your initiative to, to display them in public with this visible women initiative, it's really extremely important. Huge, huge. I don't think that we can underlie that yeah. Uh, enough. Yeah, you I know. think, that, sorry. No, no, I was going to say, and even the, the campaign, um, the four-year campaign very early on, um, and when we came up against some real quite uh, misogynistic views about the statue and raising it, it was quite shocking to actually witness these things that it, it really felt like nothing had changed since Mary's time. You know, some of the, the difficulties that we had initially when we first started the campaign were really, really shocking and quite backward. Um, so it's still out there, but it's still, you know, still quite a difficult thing to get your head around. Yeah, I don't think that that we are aware of it. Mm. You, you can't be really aware until until you you come to this uh, misogyny and and the problems that you've faced. It's it's horrible. Mm. I I also think that we must have uh, some uh, questions. And it's time to start the question and answer session. And we will have some minutes to, to uh, answer the questions we have received. And so there is a question about, uh, oh, there is a question uh, about translation of the book into uh, language, languages that were not on the list, uh, the translation of Geas. Um, so Anna. 
Yeah, it's the question of uh, Milena, I, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, of course, uh, 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 we will be grateful and, and happy to uh, uh, that has can be translated into other languages, uh, EFG, uh, through its communication manager, Anita Stein, she's coordinating these tags, and, and we will be delighted that the project uh, reach uh, more corners of the world, so it's only to contact and we, we can talk and, and expand it, so, of course. So it's possible, yeah, it's, I, I think, yeah, it was from Milena, but actually, I suppose there are also some other people uh, today here uh, present who, who actually also came maybe to, to the same idea. Uh, so there are no, uh, no more questions, just many uh, people in chat. You can see that uh, they really liked your presentations, both of them, and find them uh, as uh, impressive as I do. <laughs> and I just wanted to ask Anna if uh, I know it's it's a bit like a childish question, but you know I, I'm a child, <laughs> so uh, my question is if you could single out the one you know the one uh, uh, I, I would say uh, geoscientific hero uh, that you wrote about, uh, so who would it be? Well, for me, the favorite you say. Well, um, <laughs> all of them, uh, after reading uh, a lot uh, of them, I think they are all now part of me, uh, because when, when I decided to study geology, I, I really haven't any, any reference, so now I, I can uh, take uh, details from each, uh, each other, but uh, perhaps um, that it, the one or the two that are more related with my the subject I, I research is uh, Inge Lehmann or Marie Tharp. So they, they are for me uh, the most uh, <laughs> near. So, to, so I, I have a special love for them, but all of them has uh, really, really experience that we have all to, to learn and to, to, take, uh, to take care to not repeat some uh, problems that they have faced during their careers. Yeah, thank you. And I, I must say that uh, although I, I am not, you know, geophysicist, I uh, ha I work in, let's say, field of geoenergy. I also uh, really like and I would favorite uh, Inge Lehmann and also Marie Tharp. Yeah, I find them totally. I find all these beautiful, uh, marvelous women really, uh, really inspiring, but I would also single out to those two. Thank you very much. And uh, now uh, to Anya, there is another question, sorry, uh, just before. Uh, what does uh, STEM stands for? Uh, it's just the science, technology, uh, engineering and mathematics. So it's a short, short answer. I, I was so, um, well, I was, uh, my, your presentation was, let's say, ice widening for me, mm. not maybe ice opening, but definitely ice widening. Mm. And uh, I, I wanted you mention your uh, daughter and that she was 10 when she uh, really became interested in legacy of Mary Anning. And I wanted to ask, um, was it like something very, mm, uh, were there uh, uh, any uh, girls her age who were also interested? Like, did she have also friends who were interested in the work of Mary Anning, or was she like single? I there's um, there's there's two answers to that. So Evie, my daughter, uh, and her friends were inspired by Mary because Evie sees herself as a feminist. So it was more to do with Mary as a woman and her story and what she did and how amazing. And that story is just so incredible because it, regardless of what she did, that story of self-education and becoming famous in her own right at the age of 25. And um, it's just incredible because she actually wants to go to space. She wants to she's um, uh, she wants to go to NASA. So that's her, her dream. That's what she wants to do rather than geology and earth sciences. Um, and the, her group of friends at school were all, all this brilliant teacher um, because it was a hundred years of suffrage about four years ago. So we were celebrating, they were celebrating that at school. 
And it was her teacher that showed them the picture of Millicent Fawcett's statue in Parliament Square, which triggered this whole, well, can I go and see Mary's statue? You know, so it was that knock on effect from that. But in answer to, I think what you're trying to get at is that since we've started the charity and we're very, very vocal on social media. So if anyone wants to catch up with where we're at, at the moment we are create, we're actually physically making and building the statue. So there's some brilliant imagery on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So whatever your poison is, choose your poison. We're on there. And you can see all, all the stages of the creating this statue, which has been an absolute joy to do. Um, but because we're so active on social media, we have absolutely hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children, little boys, little girls, especially with a certain age demographic who absolutely love her. Um, and we constantly get letters. The other day, Evie got 20 handwritten letters from these lovely kids in a city centre school in London. And I said, well, you can do a computer one and then you can just handwrite the names. And she was like, no, I'm going to handwrite. And it took her days. <laughs> she answered all the questions, and and then we get photographs back of them all with their holding their letters and their stick. And we've got stickers that we share. So there is a real um, there's a real connectivity with Mary's story um, and children, definitely. And also because she's now on the curriculum, each year, whenever I go down to the beach along the Jurassic Coast, you can see more and more families. But it's the kids, you can tell the kids are dragging the parents because they've learned about her in school and taking the children, uh, the, the mums and dads down to the beach and them telling their parents about. So that that generation are definitely guardians of Mary and, and she's in safe hands. It's just that kind of peripheral of people around, around um, that we need to educate more. But yeah, it's, it's amazing how many kids... Um, but you know, she Mary's also coined with kind of giving us that whole dinomania. You know, she was the one that that kickstarted it all, um, and and children just love dinosaurs. So there's that definitely lovely connectivity around the whole thing. Sorry, yeah. a, a long winded answer. No, it was it was really uh, interesting because one has to you know wonder whether there is uh, really an interest from uh, younger generations for. Um, you know, such people uh, like passionate fossil hunters. Mm. It's not something that they are not just, you know, everyday typical role models. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah I don't want to mention today's role models, <laughs> but they are nothing like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, I wondered, yeah, wh whether it's something very, you know, something very unique for your daughter or you find it uh, also among other children, but... Yeah, no, I, and, and there's another thing as well. It's like a real barometer of how children's mindsets are changing. We have a thing in the UK called World Book Day. I don't know whether it's a, a European thing. And children are allowed to dress up as a famous character from their favourite book, and they take the book into school. And every year, more and more and more, and we get photographs sent all the time of all these children dressed as Mary going in and taking books in like Stone Girl, Bone Girl and Lightning Mary. There's, and there's... You know, we're writing a book. We've we've been asked to write a book about our journey as well. Um, and when you start investigating books on Mary, there's there's either really very kind of uh, scientific, -y, quite dry books about her. There's one or two sort of fictional, wrapped like a Tracy Chevalier type thing. But the majority majority of books written about Mary are for children, and that just says it all, really. You know, when you look at it like that. So yeah, there's a there's a real love. Uh, for Mary and paleontology and fossils, and we, we see it, it's huge. So thank you. Um, we come to our next uh, question, but I think you've already answered, how can we know more about the project Visible Women? You said that you have really answered on all poisons. <laughs> <laughs> so Visible Women is, is separate. To, so Mary Annie Rocks is Sorry. all over mm -hmm. Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. you can catch up with Mary Annie Rocks. Visible Women, we've only got a Twitter page. We've only just recently started that. And it was mainly to kind of capture um, anybody else who, oh, well, I live, I live in Stockholm and I'd like to raise a statue. Come and talk to us. You know, we're, we're kind of got, we've got like a, 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 a to Z <laughs> map now from trial and error, you know, about four years ago, there, there wasn't any kind of, um, but now we've got a real set way of how, all sorts of different ways to go about doing that, but yeah. Um, so on Twitter, um, Visible Women UK. 
uh, I would just say that visible women need more visibility. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there is another question, and it's both uh, for both uh, of you, for Anna as well as Anya. So, what do you think? Uh, that can be done against the unjust treatment of women, not only in the sciences, but, but only in, also in general? Well, for me, it has been um, especially relevant uh, in my career to find uh, a group of female colleagues with uh, whom to discuss and seek uh, joint uh, initiatives or organize um, mentoring programs or or outreach activities, um, in fact, support us and not allow discriminatory events to occur in our environment. I think this is uh, very important, not only in science, you, you need it in, in every, uh, in every uh, job or in life in general. So this, uh, I think it's uh, the most important. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank Definitely. You. I, I just want to add to that, that um, is to call it out. If it doesn't feel right, doesn't look right, call it out. Mm. Um, sometimes that's not easy and it's a quite a, a bold and quite bullshit thing for me to just say. Um, but the older and more experienced I get, the less I want to placate anything that I see that's wrong. Um, I About six years ago, I actually sued the company I work for for sexual discrimination for uh, part-time working mothers um, and won. And it was one of the most stressful things I ever did. I wouldn't ever recommend it, but when I came out the other end of that horrendous experience, I knew that what I'd done was to set a precedent for people like that man not to be able to ever do that again for anybody else. And I think the more we stand up to be counted and to make a difference and to call things out, even, even minor things, and just stop, you know, taking I don't know it's it's easy for me to say and I know it's, it's it's difficult especially when it's around careers and you don't want to be a whistleblower um but wherever you can especially if you can get more than one person if there's a this is a group of you so yeah I I just don't I think it's because I'm going through the menopause <laughs> I literally don't I'm going to swear I don't take any shit from men anymore you know I'm married to a gorgeous man and I've got a gorgeous son and I'm very lucky because I, I see a lot of stuff out there that's not great and it needs to be called out and it needs to stop. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that would sum up to, yeah, we as women, we have to stand up for ourselves and we have to connect, connect with each other and we have to stand up and fight fight the fight that we need to fight in, not just for ourselves but yeah. also for for other women who who will come after us yeah, be, be, yeah I think thorn it was important yeah. i think yeah. your battle was really important as you said it was for greater good yeah. yeah yeah at the time it didn't feel like it but now i know that that was totally i knew it was the right thing to do but i know now i think it had much more fundamental repercussions you know because that's now gone down in law and that changed the way employers and certain people could behave so yeah 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 just wait for the menopause and then start getting really <laughs> aggressive it's great <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you very much so uh perfect so i think that we've answered i i believe there are many more questions but uh, i suppose not all of many people have just praised you uh in i love i love the um, i love the comment i think it's helena said i wonder if there's a statue of a, of a john goat yeah <laughs> i've then, read it it's hilarious and then melina said in the netherlands there are more ceos of of peter than there are of number of total female i know it's just shocking isn't it it's just yeah that's it just stop <laughs> it's gotta stop yeah, that, that's why uh, I think that uh, visible, uh, or visible Women uh, is such a great initiative and that you have to keep, keep on with it. Yeah. And thank you very much for being with us uh, here today. And just to uh, uh, mention it uh, once more that uh, the webinar uh, is uh, being recorded and the recording will be available at the NG YouTube channel. So hopefully some other people will uh, come to these uh, important messages that you shared with us today. 
And thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank nice you. to meet you all. Also, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.